Microscope, microscope. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. How's it going? I hope you're doing well. Check out how green everything is. Check out how green all that stuff is. Check out how green everything is. Check out how green all that stuff is. So a little while ago, I released a video called Solving the Debate Bro Problem. This video set out to criticize two left-leaning political live streamers, Vosh and Xanderhal, for behavior that I found problematic. I looked at a few different examples. So Vosh's interaction with the smaller video essayist, Professor Flowers, Xanderhal's video that was critical of myself and some other lefty content creators, and various elements of their respective communities' behavior. After the video's release, Vosh and Xanderhal both reacted reacted to it live on their streams, in videos that have since been uploaded to YouTube. They had many criticisms. I went on to Vosh's stream to talk with him about some of those criticisms. Vosh also released another video on the subject titled Solving the Video Essayist Problem, which was critical of my video's argumentation, or lack thereof, some say. Some say that, not me though. I would never say something, I would never say that. I've linked all of those in the description if you're a, sort of a creep that wants to watch all that stuff. The video's reception was, well, divisive might be the right word. On the one hand, you had a lot of people who understood where I was coming from, who empathized with my frustrations about these spaces, or just were able to have a laugh at the way I went about highlighting them. Vine boom sound. Vine boom sound. Vine boom sound. Vine boom. On the other hand, though, a lot of people didn't like the video. This dislike ranged from, hey man, normally like your videos, but this one was a miss. This wasn't it, chief. Mr. Chief, this was not it. Mr. Chief. Halo 7 marriage all the way to this is the worst video essay of all time that should be wiped clean from the internet along with your channel the latter response was basically the takeaway from the streamers themselves i am not joking when i say to all of you with full sincerity that this is quite possibly the worst takedown I've seen. It's really disappointing how much of the online left can be convinced by such stupid arguments if they're said by somebody with a nice mustache and some bisexual lighting and, and, and the uh, lo-fi uh, chill music in the background. Vosh at one point even offered me a cash reward of double the video's ad revenue to take it down. Uh, if Noah Samson deletes the video and publicly retracts the information within, then he can screenshot the AdSense info within it and I will give him money so that he doesn't lose a cent from de uh, deleting it. I'll double it. So naturally, I took it down. I got the money and then I put the video back up. I plan on doing that a few hundred more times. Boss just keeps paying me. Unlimited money glitch. Mother load. Just kidding, that whole thing was a joke. I can't take money from the CIA, I still use TurboTax, it would be a mess. But okay, why are we here today, Noah? Why are we talking about your last video? grow up, move on. Well, I want to talk today about what I experienced in the aftermath of making it. I want to do this because after I released the video, frankly, some weird stuff happened and some bad stuff happened. And I want to talk about that and connect the weird bad stuff to the experiences of other people. I want to outline how this happens, what the backlash from debate streaming communities looks like, what's at stake for some of the people who experience it, and maybe what can be done about it eventually. Probably not today, but someday. So yeah, super vague, but um, I will get into it. Right after, we quickly take a moment of silence for all those lives lost during that one thing. And then we take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Casetify. If you like having a phone that isn't all fucked up and gross and weird, then you're gonna love Casetify. These phone cases are the bee's knees. Casetify's new line of impact and ultra impact cases are made from 65% recycled and plant-based materials. They come in 100% recycled packaging made with recycled paper and non-toxic soy ink, which comes from soy beans. You hear that? I can feel the soy. I'm becoming a man. These cases are just solid, man. They're, they're, they're like really well made. They look good. Yes, I do have an Android. And yes, it is corny to make fun of people for that in 2022. The cameras on the them are fine now. Look, there's three of them. This is the latest Android, and as you can see, the video quality is virtually lossless. Casetify's QI Tech 2.0 technology offers drop protection of up to 9.8 feet. The cases are also wireless charging and 5G compatible. You can feel the 5G when you put your phone to your head. It's airdropping Kimberly Crenshaw PDFs into my frontal lobe. They have a whole bunch of cool styles, and they offer custom ones as well. Here's my custom ones. Pretty cool, right? Check it out. Everybody's favorite game. Fortnite. The cases have an antimicrobial coating that kills 99% of bacteria. No more germs on your phone. So Casetify wanted me to do a drop test with their case to make sure my phone survives and lives on another day. So let's do it. Why not? I don't give I don't give a fuck. Damn, son. 
Son, where'd you find this? Looks fine. Thank you. Buy the product. Go to casetify.com slash Noah Sampson to get 15% off your order. Save your phone so you can call your family or something. I don't know. Okay, back to the video now. All right, so after all of the events that I went over, which was my video, the responses, the debate, and the other content, I started seeing one comment pop up in different places on the web. The comment says that basically in my conversation with Bosch, I walked back my entire video, admitted to it being full of lies and misinformation, and should therefore delete the video. I've received versions of this comment hundreds of times, maybe thousands at this point if we're counting tweets, from not only fans of these creators, but from the creators themselves. So is this what happened? Did I walk back my video in the debate? And at first, I wasn't sure. So I watched it back, only to discover that, um, no, this did not happen. In my conversation with Vosh, I conceded three points, and none of these points stand in the way of my video's main arguments. The driving issues behind my video, the reasons why I made it, were Vosh's treatment of Professor Flowers and Xander Hall's problematic language. The three points that I conceded in the debate had nothing to do with these. It has been a little while, so if your memory's a little hazy on it, I encourage you, go back and watch the debate. That is what happened. And yet, here we have countless people jumping into my comment sections to self-right proclaim something that is demonstrably false, and using this falsehood as a justification to force my hand into deleting a video. That seems a bit weird, right? Lest this come off as me saying that no, I did not get owned actually, as I slowly shrink into a corn cob. That's not true. I, I did get owned. Roughly a million people on the internet think I'm the worst video essayist of all time, and I'm fine with that. Honestly, I am. What I'm not a big fan of, though, is, is being bullied, and sometimes it's hard for me to tell when that's happening, and I have since realized that it did happen here. Now, here one might object, well, Noah, you went onto the debate stream and you were conciliatory. You didn't argue for your positions well, and you backtracked enough points that if people got the impression that you don't believe what you said in your video, can you really blame them? And initially, I actually agreed with this point. I was like, you know, yeah, I guess this is just kind of what happens when you go on debate streams. Especially if you go on unprepared and unseasoned in the art of debate, as I was and still am. I'm not coming back on, guys, so don't ask. I should have known better than to go on that stream. Ultimately, this might be my fault, or so I thought. When I actually took a step back, though, and thought about it, and then watched the debate a few more times, I realized that no, that's bullshit. People should not be allowed to lie about stuff just because I didn't go full debate lord in the debate realm. That should not be standard procedure. I entered that conversation attempting to seek understanding. I felt bad, frankly, after seeing how poorly my video was received. Like, what the f fuck is that? And how if my goal was to put a stop to the bad behavior I tried to call out, then the video was a failure. I went on wanting to try to like, I don't know, figure out what went wrong, I guess. And when this audience of people saw me do that, what they saw was weakness. And they took that weakness as a sign to go on the attack. And that's what they did. They took whatever they could to discredit me. And now because of this, they feel justified vindicated even in bullying me into silence cancel culture the woke twitter mob strikes again <laughs> One thing that's been brought up a few times is the question of where do we draw the line between criticism and harassment? Where does warranted punishment for having a bad take turn into abuse? I think making this distinction at times can be difficult, but I think in the case of larger streamers like Bosch, there are factors about their medium which can elevate standard criticism into harassment territory quicker and more easily than creators in other mediums. It can also sustain this harassment for longer than it might elsewhere. And this is really more of a theory derived from from what I've seen these creators say and my own experiences, but like, okay, you have a few thousand people watching you, giving you positive feedback and that feedback is reciprocated. The chat's like, Oh man, man, they're doing you dirty, man. It's super fucked up what they're doing to you, dude. Oh, they're really bad. And sometimes the streamer's like, you know what? Yeah, they are fucked up, dude. Fuck these guys. I hate them spit on them and the chat's like yeah yeah a lot of times the chat wants blood this is something that has been acknowledged within the community now i'm really not trying to point the finger of blame in any one direction here this process has a lot of moving parts you have the creators themselves their orbiters the communities the subreddits the forums the hours and hours and hours of streams the comment sections where the spiciest most sycophantic takes are rewarded with the sweet sweet dopamine of likes and faves and retweets and reposts. And all of it coalesces into one single force field 
that incentivizes drama farming and misrepresentation. Maybe we could term this the Vosh effect or something, because I think a lot of times criticisms against him are actually criticisms of this effect. But this energy bounces back and forth between fandom and creator until narratives are formed. And then those narratives are used as justification for all kinds of bullying, harassment, and coercion against perceived adversaries. And given the distance and speed at which these narratives can travel, a lot of times there's enough space between the actual harassment going on and the creators that it's really difficult to hold people accountable. But what's worse is that sometimes you get creators directly calling for the harassment, dogpiling, or brigading of other creators. If you're familiar with these spaces, you're probably familiar with this approach. Recently, Vosh did this to a creator some of you may know. Her name is Natalie Wynn, aka ContraPoints. Left Tube's mom. In the aftermath of the Vosh, JK Rowling, ironic misogyny debacle, none of those words are in the Bible, Natalie criticized Vosh for centering himself in the conversation on trans advocacy. And then, during his stream, Vosh said this. The thing that really bothers me is, like, is this not exactly like all of the woke scolds who would reply to contrapoints and say stuff like, um, are you done invalidating the voices of trans women who have been hurt by your content? It's such a shitty, presumptuous, woke scold kind of behavior because you're presupposing, yeah. The more of you are in the replies being like, that's not what's happening right here. Like, this is necessary, okay? Publicly shame her into changing her mind on this. So what he did here is harassment. With 7,000 people watching, he made an explicit command to his supporters, telling them to go pile onto Natalie with support for his position until she changed her mind, or, you know, bent the knee, as it were. And lo and behold, his audience followed suit. And shortly after this, Natalie ended up locking her Twitter account and blocking Vosh. Now, I'm not a mind reader, okay? I can't pretend to know exactly what her motivations here were for doing these things. But what I can tell you, as someone who has gone through what I would consider a similar experience, being dogpiled by Vosh fans, this response does not surprise me at all. In the face of being flooded with massive amounts of undue condescension, I completely understand the decision to go private and block him. It doesn't matter how big your platform is or how experienced you might be, this stuff can really take a toll on you. This dogpiling is one of the things that drove of Lindsay Ellis, another prominent video essayist, into quitting YouTube altogether. I mentioned before how Vosh offered me a cash bounty of double my ad revenue if I deleted my video. Well, when I did actually take the video down for a short period of time, he made a point to say that while his offer did still stand, it wasn't meant to be like a threat. It was intended as more of a chest beating mafia style sort of bluff thing. It does make me look bad though. It was, it was, it was meant to be kind of like a mafioso chest beating thing, which I only did because I've been sort of compromised by this, you know? Which, in a way, I understand. I didn't see it as a malicious thing. The problem with that, though, is what this sentiment results in. When Vosh says stuff like this, he might be using ironic bravado or whatever, but his following, when they say it, when they call me a spineless loser that should delete his channel and make fun of me for stuttering and various other bad stuff, they mean that shit. <laughs> These people become emboldened by this rhetoric to act in a manner that might on the surface just seem abrasive, but in actuality ends up being just genuinely abusive and coercive. And much like how each tweet from his fans that went after Natalie all berated her with the same message, that she's wrong, with the intent of bullying her into changing her mind, each comment on my video was essentially a copy and paste of his statements with the intended goal of bullying me into deleting it. Not, I'm not liking this floof here. How do I get rid of the floof? Haircut? Is that how you do it? It does make me wonder, like, how much of this is motivated by his fans' genuine beliefs, and how much of it is them just following orders. And while the exact ratio may be tough to find, I do know that were he not to make these statements and commands, this dogpiling would not be taking place. It's precisely this effect, the collective Vosh unconscious, that had me legitimately doubting my own intentions with my video. The influx of this type of stuff in the week after its release is part of what led me to actually take the video down for a little bit. If you read things like this enough times, it really starts to get into your head. The combination of them being so confident that they're correct, while airing these feelings of victimization with such condescension, this is what eventually results in people being forced to fall in line by this community. It results in damage control when things come out that make them look bad, and it's a really problematic dynamic. Another more recent example of this dynamic can be found in an extremely long and complicated interaction that Vosh had with the YouTuber Cat Black. To be clear, this one 
one was a mess. As such, I'm only going to look at one specific example from it that relates to what I'm talking about here. I will try to give as much context as is necessary. So around the time of Vosh's JK Rowling stuff, Kat made a tweet thread asking specifically trans women in her audience about the efficacy of the ironic misogyny Vosh displayed. So basically asking, what do we think about this? Vosh eventually messaged her about the thread and they went back and forth. Kat ended up leaking these DMs when she felt that Vosh had misrepresented their contents to his stream. So during this exchange, Vosh's community attempted to rewrite the order of events with the goal of discrediting Kat by painting her as a sexual abuser. Their justification for this accusation was that Kat had made sexual comments about Vosh without his consent, pictured here. What this accusation is leaving out, though, is that what she said here was directly responding to Vosh saying this on his stream while referencing Kat. Yeah, Vosh, pretty much exactly what Kat states he's into. All right, are you guys ready for the mildest hot take in the universe? Okay. Super idpol, like, lefty black women who are like really condescending to white people in terms of their ability to engage in political discourse. Love fucking white dudes. It's the exact same reason that racist white guys all watch interracial porn to jerk off to. It's the exact same thing. It's identical. There's no difference. It's literally the exact same goddamn thing. It's true. I'm sorry, guys. People who have like racist thoughts tend to like weirdly fetishize uh, like interracial race shit for like probably reasons they should be more critical of. So neither of these things are good, right? Weird, sexually charged, invasive race play fetish rants are bad. Body shaming and leaking DMs are also bad, generally speaking. Her reasoning for leaking the DMs justifies the leak, in my opinion, but that's just me. However, while people can argue back and forth about which of these is worse, the point here is that the offensiveness of what Vosh said was almost completely ignored, while the offensiveness of what Kat said has been singled out and used as a line of attack. I'm not making a comment about which is worse. We shouldn't do either, but the point stands. Especially given that her tweet is directly responding to this invasive rant from Vosh. He said that stuff first. There is a different standard being applied here by this audience of people, and that's bad. Also, what's important to note here is that Kat later acknowledged her mistake in making this comment about Vosh in a tweet thread, but did Vosh acknowledge making any mistakes here, like talking about her in that manner on his stream? I don't know, and I have no plans of watching a seven-hour stream to find out. Maybe he did, but based on how his community still calls her a sexual harasser to this day, I have my doubts. And okay, so another thing somebody might say here is, well, Noah, doesn't your video encourage people to dogpile onto debate bros? It does paint them in a pretty bad light. Why is what you've done just considered criticism, but when we do it, it's harassment? And the thing is, you would be right to ask these questions. I'm willing to acknowledge that videos like mine contribute to this culture. They create negative impressions that can lead to dogpiling. It took me going through all of this to realize that this is one of the responsibilities of having a platform. And it's something I plan on taking seriously moving forward. You can't control what everyone does online, obviously, but you can take steps to be more responsible. So something like making it clear to my audience that if they're going to comment on someone's work who I'm criticizing, don't do it unless you're going to be constructive or at least not be a dick. But my video's lack of disclaimers is so much different than Vosh actively weaponizing his audience against other creators, dogpiling them and coercing them into getting what he wants. And I think that difference is worth taking into account. And despite this difference, despite the fact that my video essay did not explicitly call for any public action against Vosh, as he's done here, I do recognize that it still could have had the same effect. Which again, is why, not just for streamers, but video essays too, and really everyone on this platform with a large audience, we need to be more responsible, especially when we're dealing with people who don't have our same level of protection. Now, I do want to be clear here, once there was some communication between Vosh and I, once he was at least aware that the video I made did not set out to attack him unjustly, this condescension died down. After around this time, as far as I know, he didn't go out of his way to stir up drama on his stream. The wave of these comments slowed. Also a war started, so that could be part of it. But I didn't do that, so I would never do that. I, I hate war. 
He addressed our conflict on a recent stream and did so in what I felt was a fair manner. Noah Sampson. I don't think that he's dumb. A lot of people in my community have said that he's dumb. I don't actually think that. I think that snark, when applied unwisely, can often come across as dumb because it gives the impression of uh, a, a sort of confident ignorance of a subject, you know? We'll see how things play out with him. And I do appreciate this, but there's just... There's something missing here, if I were to just leave it at that. Because while I'm willing to acknowledge that in our direct interactions, Vosh has been fair to me, what I can't look past is the way that through the mobilization of his community, he has caused harm. Not just to me, but to other more vulnerable people. The backlash has been exhausting for me. I hit a low point during the weeks following my video's release, which was the lowest I've been in a long time. But the thing is, no matter how bad this experience might have been for me, ultimately, I've had it easy compared to others. And there are a few reasons for this. I am someone who already has a decently sized platform. I have a base of online support, and from this, direct material stability. I do this full time and I have the freedom to take breaks when things get heavy. What's more is that I am also afforded certain protections that a lot of other people are not. I cannot be attacked in the same way that marginalized creators can, with the weight of actual discrimination and persecution compounding on top of these attacks. With the attacks themselves being capable of levying transphobia, homophobia, sexism, or racism, of attacking people for who they are. They can't do that to me. What this means is that there's a certain amount of deferential treatment going on here that I think is worth exploring. The deferential treatment in this case being from the communities that are motivated by Vosh's actions. If you want an example of what this deferential treatment looks like, all we have to do is look at what happened to Professor Flowers. Professor Flowers released a video last week that goes over her experience of dealing with the backlash from debating Vosh. In it, she describes how difficult it's been for her to get back to making videos. It's taken her over six months to do so, and one of the reasons for this is the racist harassment that she has experienced. And regardless of how you feel that she portrayed herself in their debate or in any subsequent videos or streams, this is something that should be unacceptable. I do recommend that you go watch her video. I'll leave it linked in the description. One of the most frustrating parts about this whole thing is the fact that even by just mentioning her in this video, I have to contend with the fact that I might be reigniting some level of harassment against her and any of the people I mention. And that's just really shitty that that's how this has to be. I did get her permission to include her in this video, but the fact that I felt the need to ask, I think, says something. Anyways, let's look at one example of differential treatment from her situation. So, this is a thumbnail from a prominent Vosh Clips channel featuring an image of a photoshopped black Adolf Hitler. The video that this thumbnail is on is a segment from Vosh's debate with Professor Flowers. The video is titled, Vosh owns a black white supremacist in this debate. It has been deceptively edited to make it seem as though Professor Flowers says things that she doesn't say. This includes a moment where they make it look like she calls her own father an oppressor because he's white. Many viewers took this at face value, commenting how messed up it was that she talk about her family like that, even though she never did. The account admits to having done this, but says that it's fine because according to them, she probably believes it anyway. This is something that should be unacceptable. And before you say that it is, that this sort of behavior is denounced, and that members of Vosh's community are purged if they're found acting in racist ways, the channel has has 25,000 subscribers. This is more subscribers than Professor Flowers herself has. Professor Flowers tweeted a screenshot of this thumbnail, which made the rounds. The video itself has 25,000 views and a 98% like to dislike ratio. And Vosh follows this account on Twitter. They know about this, they just don't care or they don't see the racism. And I'm not really sure which one of these is worse, but I think both should be unacceptable. A related example here of this sort of differential treatment is with a creator that I mentioned earlier, Cat Black. Now, in the past month or so, following this interaction with Vosh, Cat has mentioned how she's experienced racism from white leftists even more than she's seen from racist white conservatives. Now, for context, Cat is someone who's been around on YouTube for a long time, since 2005 to be precise. Goober Noah for scale here, this is me in 2005. Hello! Technically YouTubing, so that's cool. But my point is, Kat has been doing this for a while. She was on YouTube at the height of the anti-SJW wave, through all the reactionary and alt-right stages of content creators, and she's still uploading today. So when she makes this comment that she's received, quote, way more shit from white leftists than she does from racist white conservatives, immediately following this conflict with Vosh, with his identity politics arguments being spat 
at her online, well, that's something that should probably ring some alarm bells, no? A similar sentiment was expressed last month by Professor Flowers during another wave of harassment from Vosh fans. She wrote on Twitter, I've literally experienced less racism growing up around white conservatives. There seems to be some sort of pattern here that may be worth noting. I don't know what it is, but it's super crazy. Oh my gosh, how'd that, what happened? I don't know. One of the ways that Vosh and his community operate that serves to control the narrative is by outwardly and loudly condemning harassment when it is made public. I remember tweeting a screenshot of some harassment I received on Reddit DMs from a Vosh fan a while ago. Members of his community, like mods, immediately came in and sort of made a display of the fact that the person harassing me had been banned and that they didn't tolerate that type of stuff. And while I'm inclined to say that this is a good thing, that this is what is supposed to happen, at the same time, I can't help but wonder, why is this still up? Obviously, they know about it, and they haven't done anything. And my guess is that when it comes to people that they've collectively decided are okay to punch down on, people like Professor Flowers, then there's no real incentive to crack down on this stuff. When the people at the top have signaled that being mean and dogpiling the bad people is okay, then why would anyone say anything? If it's not advantageous from a PR perspective, then why bother? A related point here, and something that Lua brings up in her video, is that examples like these really make you wonder just how much racist shit goes on in these spaces unchecked. How many so-called leftists from this community have felt emboldened by Vosh or any one of his orbiters to pile on to Professor Flowers? And how many of them are going to get away with it? How many of them will say years down the line, oh man, that Professor Flowers drama was, was really crazy, right guys? It was fun while it lasted though. Meanwhile, you know, six months of racist harassment that almost resulted in Lua quitting YouTube and worse. And that just really doesn't sit right with me, you know? And I hope it doesn't with you either. I hope this causes you to wonder like, hey, why does stuff like this only seem to be a problem when people shine a spotlight on it? Are we okay with this sort of deferential treatment for marginalized creators just because it's been greenlit from the top? These are things that I feel like we should be thinking about, but I don't, but I don't know. But I don't know anything actually, so don't. Don't listen to me. So time has passed, right? And as I said, things have mostly calmed down for me, but I still wanted to speak on this experience, not just because it has been exhausting, but really because I know I haven't seen anywhere close to the worst of it. And that genuinely worries me. It worries me for the people that may experience this without the protections that I am afforded or without the support base of being somewhat established as a content creator. It saddens me for the people who have already gone through it, people who I know are just trying to do good with the odds stacked against them and being nearly driven off of the platform because of it. I really don't want to see that happen to anyone, and regardless of your opinions of any of the people that I mentioned here, I hope you can understand where I'm coming from when I say that. This video is not a personal attack on any of the creators that I've mentioned. All of this does stem from my concern over mistreatment in online spaces, and thus mistreatment in any form in my name is... Don't do it, okay? Don't do it. Don't be little freaks, okay? Okay, well, be little freaks, but not not that kind. But yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Thanks again to Casetify for sponsoring this video. Go to casetify.com slash Noah Sampson to get 15% off your order. Great product. That's my name. I like, I like, really like this one. And a very special thank you to my patrons who should be scrolling by right now. You guys are awesome. And I hope to bring you some content very soon. Seriously, message me on there and tell me what you guys want because I don't know what anyone wants from me in my life these days. And last thing, I am aware of all of the criticisms from my last video. I know some of you might be upset that this wasn't a full retraction with a, an apology extended mag clip type video. I may eventually touch on those in a video or in writing or something, but for now I thought this was the more important thing to talk about. Regardless of whether or not you agree with that decision, I hope you can understand where I'm coming from there. Anyways, take it out. Take, take it peasy. Take it easy peasy lemon squeezy. <laughs> Peace out and goodbye. And see ya. Bye. Orange? Bra what if I was Italian? What if, What then? What would you say? That's how I made their environment. And... Okay. Good job, Noah. Goodbye. Can we watch the movie?